At the end of 2021, a group of astronomers dedicate, uh, detected unusual signals from deep in the heart of our Milky Way galaxy. More recently, another group happened upon a celestial object releasing giant bursts of energy, unlike anything ever seen before. These mysterious signals were discovered using recently built radio astronomy facilities, the Murchison Widefield Array Telescope and ASCAP, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder. Radio astronomers around the world are now looking back at their data to see if there have been similar detections in other parts of the galaxy. Are these indeed rare one-off events or vast new populations we simply never noticed before? Good evening, everyone. My name is Simon Steele, Senior Director of Education Outreach at the SETI Institute, and I'd like to welcome you all to the March edition of SETI Talks. These talks are offered free to anyone in the world, and we do get listeners and viewers uh, all around the world. Please do let us where you're checking in from um, in the chat, and uh, we'll read out some of these locations as we go through the evening. And as with previous talks, this one will be, uh, will be available to watch uh, on our YouTube channel. A reminder also that the SETI Institute is a nonprofit organization and we do rely heavily on public donations. So if you'd like to sponsor future SETI talks, do contact us at uh, development at SETI.org. So to discuss these mysterious signals from deep space, we've invited two researchers, Tara Murphy, professor at the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Sydney, and Natasha Hurley Walker, head of the Extra Galactic Radio Astronomy Group at Curtin University, who are both involved in the recent publication of these signals. Moderating the discussion tonight is Franck Mochis, the Senior Planetary Astronomer at the SETI Institute. So without further ado, Franck, let's hear more about these mysterious radio signals in the Milky Way. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so let me just describe a little bit um, who are our speakers today. Uh, first of all, uh, Natasha Hurley-Walker. Hi, Natasha. How are you? Hi, Frank. I'm great. Good to, great to be here. So, Natasha, you are calling us from which city? I'm in Perth, Western Australia. Okay. Uh, Natasha is a radio astronomer. Um, she's uh, studied uh, radio astronomy uh, for a long time. She received a PhD in this field at the University of Cambridge. Uh, she moved later in, in Australia uh, to help for the commissioning of the Murchison Wide Field Array. And we are going to talk about this instrument specifically. Um, Natasha has, uh, is known as well for work on gender equity, uh, outreach activity. Uh, she has received numerous prizes. I'm not going to say all of them, but one of them is the an ABC, ABC Top 5 Scientist in 2018 and the Superstar of STEM in 2019 and 2020. So thank you very much, uh, Natasha. Uh, you're the head of the Extra Galactic Radio Astronomy Group and the lead of the, uh, the paper, if I remember properly, that we are going to talk about today. Yep, that's right. And uh, on the other window, we have Tara Murphy. Hi, Tara. How are you? Hi, I'm good, thanks. So Tara is a professor of astrophysics working in the School of Physics at the University of uh, Sydney. So you are calling us from Sydney right now? That's right. It's 1 p.m. just after lunch here in Sydney. Okay, tomorrow. It's tomorrow, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Uh, so Natasha is a PI of the ASCAP Variables and Slow Transient Project and the leads of uh, us in, um, uh, in Australia expertise in radio, in tra radio transient surveys. Um, you arrived in 2015 in Australia to work on, the, on radio follow-up of gravitational wave uh, events. And uh, we are going to talk about uh, a very interesting uh, um, body that you group uh, discover in 2021. Very interesting signals. Um, so Natasha, I know that you uh, you have prepared some kind of uh, an introduction to radio astronomy for our our listener, our, our viewers. So if you want to share your slide, let's do sure, this. I'll st I'll start. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of a, an introduction. Um, about radio astronomy in five minutes. So what is radio astronomy? I'm going to start with this really textbook image. Apologies, everyone. Um, but this is a really good way of thinking about what are radio waves. Radio astronomy is studying objects in space via detecting electromagnetic radiation at radio frequencies. Now, what does that mean? The Earth's atmosphere actually only lets in light, electromagnetic radiation, at two uh, wave bands in the visible light, which is hundreds of nanometers, that's what our eyes see, and in radio light. 
which is what we use to communicate with mobile phones, um, with televisions, with computers, and all of those things. So the telescopes on Earth can typically either see optical light from galaxies and stars, which tells us about how hot they are, um, thermal emission, and it can also see radio light from galaxies and stars and other things, which tells us about other processes going on um, in those objects. So that's what we talk about when we talk about radio astronomy. Now, what do we use to detect this radio emission? We use telescopes that often look like this. These are three of the cutting edge radio telescopes that we use to look for um, transient and variable radio sources at the moment. In the top left is um, the uh, very large array in the US in New Mexico. We have uh, Meerkat in South Africa, and the large picture is ASCAP in Western Australia. And all of these work in roughly the same way that that dish uh, captures the radio emission that's coming from astronomical objects in space and then um, processes it to create an image of the sky. That image is not uh, an image in the same way that invisible light, we're capturing photons, but it's a reconstruction of what the sky would look like if you could see at radio wavelengths. Now, when we've got these telescopes, uh, the one that we're going to, one that I'm going to talk about today is ASCAP, and the one that Natasha's going to talk about is um, the MWA. Both of those are located uh, in Western Australia, so I just thought I'd show you where they are. Um, they're northeast of Geraldton, which is north of Perth um, in Western Australia, and so they're out well away from most um, human uh, habitation, and the reason for that is to reduce radio frequency interference. So not only, so the, the, the radio signals that we see from space are extremely faint. They're really, really weak signals compared to the signals that we would detect from say using your mobile phone. And so when you go out to see our telescopes, um, you have to turn off any devices that create a radio emission because that would be much stronger than the really weak signals that we're trying to detect from space. So we have these telescopes, they uh, look at the sky, um, astronomy is quite a passive process, you know, the radiation is coming down, the telescopes are capturing it. What do you see when you look at the sky with a radio telescope? Um, this is an image that's put together from uh, the results of a recent survey with ASCAP that looked at the whole sky, uh, up covering the whole um, south of the sky and then up to plus 40 degrees in the north. Most of what you see when you look at the radio sky are called active galactic nuclei. They're supermassive black holes at the center of distant galaxies. And almost every single dot that you see on that sky is a distant galaxy. Um, the radio emission comes from electrons being accelerated to relativistic speeds um, in shocks and, and jets um, in supermassive black holes. Now, they're not the only thing you see, though. Uh, you can see across the sky there is the galactic plane. That's when you're looking into our galaxy. And in our galaxy, radio emission can be caused by things like pulsars, uh, by the shocks from supernova remnants, what's left over after a star explodes, um, and a whole range of other phenomena, some of which we're going to talk about today. So that's what you see when you look at the sky. One of the great things about radio astronomy is that the radio wavelengths, as I said, they're much longer than optical. And so they travel right through the dust um, that can obscure a lot of things if you look into a really dense part of the galaxy like the galactic center. So this is only meant to be a very short five minute introduction to radio astronomy. Um, and so I'm just going to end by saying what Natasha and I will be talking about today are two examples of things called highly variable or transient radio sources. Um, most of the things that you see when you look with the radio telescope, they're static on human timescales. So these AGN that I mentioned, they evolve over millions of years. So if you look at them today and if you look at them in 10 years time, they look exactly the same in radio. Um, these are two examples of things that are changing rapidly. So on the left-hand side is the radio detection of a gravitational wave event, which is two neutron stars merging. And you can see a little dot there appearing and getting brighter. Um, so that is from a distant event, 130 million light years away. Um, a very, very powerful event, one of the most energetic explosions in the universe. 
On the right hand side, just a contrast, you can see a tiny dot appearing and disappearing in the middle of this image. This is actually an image of Proxima Centauri, our nearest star, only four light years away, having a huge flare. And so that's the type of things we can see when we look at, in, at the variable radio sky, we can see extreme events like neutron star mergers, we can see flares from our nearest neighboring stars. Um, so I'm going to end there and, and pass over to uh, Natasha to, I think, to talk about her section or maybe to Frank. Now to Natasha, let's do that. Let's stop sharing. You ready, Natasha? Yep, just uh, waiting for Tara to stop sharing. There we go. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk a, a, a little bit about the telescope that we use to discover a really interesting source with, um, and uh, then I'm going to talk about the source. So uh, if you want to find out anything more um, about uh, my work and radio astronomy with the MWA, um, feel free to check out the links at the bottom right there. I'm pretty active on Twitter and I have a pretty up-to-date website. So the Murchison Widefield Array, unlike some of the telescopes that Tara was talking about, well, you know, in a way it doesn't look like a telescope at all. It's a series of little spidery-like dipoles laid out across about five kilometers or five by five kilometers uh, of the Western Australian desert. And these dipoles are all connected together by an enormous number of cables. Um, and rather than steer uh, dishes, we use beam forming. So we introduce delays um, electrically into the signals and that allows us to point these um, tiles uh, at different locations in the sky. So we can look around and we can correlate all of the different signals together. And you notice another thing about this telescope is that the little tiles are actually a lot smaller than those big dishes that Tara was showing. So big dishes give you a small field of view on the sky, whereas a small tile gives you a big field of view on the sky. Everything in radio astronomy is a Fourier transform. So it's basically upside down from what you'd expect. So the fact as well that we have these tiles close to each other means we can see big scales and we have this big field of view. So the MWA sees a little bit of a different view um, to ASCAP. And uh, I can just show you a little animation now. So um, this is what the, the, the Milky Way, the heart of our galaxy looks like in the optical. But if we fade to, oh, sorry, of course I uh, pressed the wrong button there. If we fade to radio, um, you'll see that uh, we're picking up like very, very beautiful diffuse emission from our, our Milky Way. So we're seeing all of these um, electrons spiraling into each other around cosmic magnetic fields. And um, we're seeing a lot of those exploded stars that Tara was talking about. So that's my role uh, here at uh, the International Center of Radio Astronomy Research. I do big surveys with the MWA. And uh, in 2020, I just started a large project um, called the Galactic and Extragalactic All Sky MWA Extended Survey. So a big project to image the, the whole sky with the MWA um, about 10 times deeper than we've ever managed before. And I thought it would be a fun idea to look at, rather than adding a lot of the data together, uh, to instead subtract one observation from the next. And so look for things that are changing. Now, Tara has pointed out there are lots of interesting radio transients, but I'm looking at frequencies which are quite a bit lower, about 10 times lower than the telescopes that Tara was describing. And so on these, uh, in these frequencies, we don't actually expect to see uh, a lot of things changing. So this was a bit of a fun project, and I actually gave it to a very capable undergraduate student. So it's his final year project uh, in his, you know, his first degree at university. Uh, and 2020 was a difficult year. But um, he did a fantastic job and actually found this uh, interesting radio source. So I'm going to show you what the radio source looks like in just one of our observations. And now bearing in mind, this is, of course, an animation. The real data looks a little bit less exciting. So um, here's the location of the source in the sky. So it's in our, the plane of our Milky Way. And what I'm mapping on the bottom left here is the brightness as it changes, like almost in real time here, um, over about a two minute observation. And so this source is getting dimmer and fainter. It has these spikes in it. It has these rumbles and it's on for about a minute and then it switches off. And this was basically, no one had ever seen anything like this before. We were really, really stunned 
to see this really strange profile in one of our observations. So of course, I looked into, um, you know, what else could we do with this? Could we find more detections? And so I looked at more data and I actually found that the source was not just, you know, on for one minute, it was on for a minute, off for 18 minutes, and then back on again, and then back off again, and then back on again, like clockwork. And so there was a repeating radio signal coming into our instrument that nobody and none of us had ever expected to detect. So there's lots and lots of possible explanations for repeating radio sources. And of course, we can come onto the SETI angle uh, in a bit, but I just wanted to show you all uh, possibly our leading theories. So repeating, like regularly repeating um, signals in space usually indicate that something is repeating. So perhaps an orbit or perhaps something rotating. Um, for reasons I don't have to get, don't have time to get into for space, um, we settled on probably it's a rotating object. And so you might know of some rotating uh, radio sources already, right? So when a massive star ends its life and collapses, you're left with a neutron star, which can have a powerful magnetic field in its crust. And this can generate radio emission that comes out at the poles. And as the neutron star turns, the radio appears to sort of go across your line of sight. And so you see a pulse just like that. Our pulses were discovered about in 1967 by Jocelyn Val Burnell. So these are a well understood phenomenon. But the thing about pulsars is they rotate every few seconds. And that's what gives them the phenomenal energy that you need in order to generate radio emission. So that's really strange because we're not seeing something that rotates every few seconds. We're seeing something instead that's changing really, really slowly. And so in theory, if it were a kind of pulsar, it wouldn't have enough energy to generate radio emission in the first place. So that seems like a little bit of a hole in this theory, but actually there's a type of source um, that kind of matches the, uh, the properties that we're seeing here called a magnetar. So a magnetar is like a pulsar, but instead of the, the magnetic field lines being nice and ordered, they can become kind of tangled and twisted and they slowly relax. And as they relax, they impart energy into the system and produce radio waves. And so we see these sources, um, but we've never yet seen one, or before, seen one that rotates every 20 minutes. It was really considered a theoretical possibility until now. Um, the other option is that potentially it could be a white dwarf. So a white dwarf is just much, much bigger. And so it has the potential to generate more energy but we've never seen a white dwarf do anything like this before. So the um, exciting thing is, of course, you know, this could be something entirely new as well. And what we're trying to do at the moment is follow up that patch of sky with basically the most powerful telescopes in the world to try and see if there's anything else there. Um, and yeah, I've been <laughs> doing a lot of like space telescope observing and working with optical astronomers. Uh, and it's all been it's all been very exciting. Um, so unfortunately, it's not producing radio waves anymore, which makes it a bit difficult to understand. Um, but you know, I like a nice mystery. And so, if it's not any of these possibilities, if it's something else, you know, that's fine. That's that's an exciting uh, development. And um, yeah, we'll see what the future holds. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sasha. Um, Tara, uh, you also discover a weird object. Sure. Uh, so I'll just I'll just talk a little bit about that. Um, oops, I've just started from the start. Let me just fast forward. Um, OK, so if you're interested in reading a bit more about this than I can cover in these few minutes, uh, there's a nice article um, here in the conversation that explains the process. Um, so what we were doing in this survey was looking at the galactic center and we were the reason we were looking there is because a lot happens towards the center of our galaxy the center of our galaxy is is where there's a high density of stars and where there's a high density of stars that means there's a lot of stars being born there's a lot of stars dying and as we know often when stars die 
they die in very energetic and exciting ways in big explosions. Um, so we were looking at the center of our galaxy. This is an ASCAP image there in the background showing the galactic center. And we found this very unusual object down here in, in the square there in, in the bottom corner. Um, and the thing that was unusual about this object is that it was emitting circular polarization. Now, circularly polarized light is very rare. Um, I'm not going to explain it here in this talk, but if you think about this, um, if you think about uh, polarization, it's like ASCAP has special sunglasses that allow it to see the kind of polarized light. In fact, the sunglasses work by filtering out polarized light from the sun. And so these circularly polarized sources, they're a sign of a particular type of process that's going on in the object. Um, that, and, and maybe only one in tens of thousands of objects exhibits this. So we, this was unusual. We thought this is interesting. It was also changing uh, its brightness by a factor of 100. That's extremely unusual in astronomy. For something to get 100 times brighter in a really short uh, time frame is, um, is, is very unusual. So these were the things that made us think there's something interesting here. Um, oh, I'll show a really technical plot here now to follow that image. Um, these are all the observations we did of this source. So once we started thinking this was interesting, we decided to keep monitoring it with various telescopes, with ASCAP, with um, the Australia Telescope Compact Array, with Meerkat. Um, and the reason that we were looking at it with Meerkat is because we were thought well, one of the things it could be, which is related to what Natasha was talking about, was some kind of odd pulsar. A pulsar, one of these uh, neutron stars, so it's left over after the death of a star. Um, it's extremely dense, it rotates extremely rapidly. And as pulsars themselves die, they can have some very strange behavior. Um, turning off and on, so it's called intermittent behavior. Um, and so this was one of the candidates. So we observed it with Meerkat, um, which is the telescope in South Africa, and then that was the, the little blue images there up in the top right, um, to see whether we could see pulses at the same time as this object was turned on. And so we were monitoring it with Meerkat. Um, and we did detect it with Meerkat, but we didn't detect any pulses. So that left us with a little bit of a mystery. What is this object? Um, and so this is a little bit like a detective. Uh, uh, this is a bit like detective work. You have to collect a lot of data about something, and then you have to go through different theoretical options or known type of objects that we know about and either try and confirm them or rule them out. So for this one, we were thinking things like, could it be a magnetar? Um, well, we took X-ray observations and there was no X-ray detected at the same time as the radio, which kind of ruled that out. Could it be radio emission flares from a really, really cool star? But we took very deep optical observations of this spot and we couldn't find any star there. And so that kind of ruled that out as an option. And so after going through a whole lot of these options, and I should say that this was our work that was done by my very talented PhD student, Ziteng Wang. And so I was sort of just guiding him through this detective work. We went through all of these options and everything was ruled out, which just left us with one sort of thing. And this now is an artist's impression of, of, of what's happening with this source. Um, with this circularly polarized emission coming from towards the center of our galaxy. It's about four degrees off the center of our galaxy and we're detecting it here on earth. Um, so after we ruled these options out, we were left with the closest thing it matched to is something called a galactic center radio transient. Now that seems like an answer, but actually galactic center radio transient is just a descriptive name for a group of about three sources are known so far, and all of those sources share similar properties to our source, but we don't know what any of them are. So it's a little group of sources that come from towards the galactic center. They they're very variable. They are quite intermittent. They have circularly polarized light. So they have a whole bunch of things in common, but all of them are also pretty different. Um, so that's where we're at at the moment with this source. We believe it's a, a, some kind of unusual um, transient, which we call a galactic center radio transient, possibly some kind of dying pulsar um, or some other strange variation 
Um, and the only way of really finding out uh, what it is, is, is two options. Firstly, to continue monitoring this in multiple with multiple different telescopes to build up a picture of the information. As Natasha mentioned with her source, the problem is when the source is not emitting all the time, um, you can waste a lot of telescope time pointing in that direction and not seeing anything. So it's pretty tricky to keep monitoring. And the other option is to find more of them so that we can build up a population and hopefully learn about them as a group, not just as one single object, or in the case of GCRTs now, four single objects. So I'll leave it there because I know that um, um, Frank had some questions. Um, I think that's a good time to, to stop with the, the initial summary. Thank you. Yes, I, indeed, I do have questions. So I'm not a radio astronomer. I'm an optical astronomer, so I'm going to probably ask questions which are very naive and probably uh, um, a bit simple. But one of the main questions, the first question I want to start, and maybe Tara, you can take this, is so why, in, why we have radio telescope for 60 years on this planet, right? And suddenly we have two papers in a row, almost, mm -hmm. publishing the discovery of a mysterious signal, mm -hmm. different one. So why yes. this is happening now and why not, not like uh, 10 years ago? That's a really good question because it is actually a sign of the revolution that's just happened in radio astronomy. So we have had radio telescopes for a long time since the end of World War II um, when radar was discovered. And, uh, but the properties of the telescopes we've had so far, they've either only been able to see a very small region of sky at once or they've had extremely low sensitivity, so they can only see very bright things. And the, the two objects that Natasha and I are talking about, they're both what's called transient. So that means you can't see them all the time, they come and go. And so if you imagine you're looking for something transient and you just look out your window once and you say, did I see it? And that's the only time you get to observe it and you didn't see it, then there could be a whole um, population of things out there that you can't possibly discover because you only got to look out the window once. And so as an example, the telescope I worked on when I was a student, um, the Malongolo telescope, uh, we took 10 years to survey the southern sky just once. Mm -hmm. The ASCAP telescope that I work on now it did a similar survey of the same kind of sensitivity and resolution in a couple of weeks. So that's how much the telescopes have changed um, in the last 10 years. So the reason these discoveries are coming out now is because we're using a couple of the new telescopes that have radically different improved you know, specifications than, than the telescopes that we've had before. And also the couple of telescopes that I showed in my, at the beginning of my talk, Meerkat, the new upgraded VLA, um, LOFAR, MWA and ASCAP are really, you know, able to get, like expand into new, in new territory here. All right. So, um, Natasha, I have a question for you because um, you show this uh, very interesting spider array. I like them. I, shook, I saw cables. So I'm assuming those cables are going somewhere to a correlator, you're going to tell me. Can you tell us a bit how you process this data, how you analyze them? Like be very concrete. Do you look at all the observations? How do you develop algorithm? What's, the, what's happening? Sure. So um, yeah, I think I, it's, it's actually kind of a follow on to Tara's comment on the previous question is that we do have this really data rich environment now. So these telescopes can provide incredible views of the sky. And I think really now we are kind of people limited in what we can what we can do right so all of the observations take powerful supercomputers to process so uh, both for ASCAP and for the MWA the signals are rooted from all those cables into a central central correlators different correlators for the different instruments but then that data gets piped to a supercomputing center here in Perth at the Pawsey supercomputing center and um, the ASCAP folks have a whole supercomputer, we have a whole supercomputer, and we both also apply for time on national supercomputers. So actually turning all of that radio data into images and then analyzing them is an enormous uh, sort of uh, deal. It's just quite, a, quite an effort. So where we're making strides now is with partnerships between astronomers and software uh, developers so that we can create quite like rigorous automated frameworks for turning all of that data into something useful and then getting some physics out of it quite quickly. 
So some of the examples of, of things that we've done with this data, um, there's uh, this is also following on why are we finding them now and why are we finding out that they're interesting? The telescopes aren't just more sensitive, they also have a wider bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So they're observing many more frequencies. If you look behind me at this, uh, this background, it's in color. Radio observations didn't used to be in color. And one cool thing that we did with, uh, with at least our source is that the different frequencies of light arrive at different times because they are being slowed down by interstellar space. It's an effect called dispersion. Since we roughly know the content of interstellar space, we can divide one by the other and get the distance of the object. And that really changes everything. So for our source, it's about 4,000 light years away. Um, with a distance, you can turn things like brightness into things like power. And so that's where you can really get to the heart of the thing and really try and figure out what it is, as opposed to just something happened somewhere along that line of sight. Um, so yeah, uh, and the same with polarization. You can't do polarization with a, with a very narrow bandwidth. So all these new capabilities, we're all doing our best to keep on top of them. But yeah, it takes powerful supercomputers, a lot of software and great partnerships where astronomers are informing the development of the software and software developers are doing it well. Uh, so it's not just our code held together by gaffer tape. Okay. So you, uh, how long does it take to go from one observation to be able to see some kind of image? Um, the maximum of the map time is dominated by the time it takes to move the data from the site to here that could take uh -huh. about 24 hours for the archiving. Uh, and then from our point of view, it could take about a few hours to do that processing to go calibration, imaging, deconvolution, um, produce some plots. Uh, we don't tend to be sitting there doing this ourselves, we tend to set off a batch job on a supercomputer to do all of these things for us and then it sends us an email and says hey you've got some cool plots to look at because you wouldn't be able to do this you know by hand so for both of you when you discover those signals uh is that a computer that discovered them first or it's a human being oh, it's well, a combination I... of both sorry go ahead oh no no you go you go it's a combination of both for us. So we have a transient detection software pipeline. It produces candidates. Um, and then from those hundreds of candidates, we look at them by hand, think about all the data we've got and find the most interesting and rare ones. Uh, we're also you know, using machine learning to identify outliers and interesting things that are, you know, that are different from the thousands of normal objects that we see. So it's both computers and humans. And for you, Natasha? Well, in our case, because we weren't really expecting to see anything, because previous searches had searched kind of, if you look above and below the galactic plane, um, they hadn't really seen anything interesting. This was just a bit of fun for us. So I had a student do the, the work and uh, Tyrone O'Doherty, if he's out there, fantastic job, Tyrone. This is really, he's on the paper, obviously. Um, and he look, he did this processing a little bit more manually. Doing this differencing is an unusual technique for us and then looking at the plots and um, basically just sending us PNGs and going, what do you think this is? Uh, now that we know the galactic plane is full of interesting things, um, I'm setting up a project to do a similar, similar to what Tara is doing with ASCAP, but um, yeah, scanning the galactic plane, producing a database of transients with visual plots that you can easily inspect. So yeah, very much a partnership between humans and computers. Okay. So you both kind of gave an hypothesis on this, the nature of these uh, mysterious signals. Um, could you tell us how concretely you do this? Uh, maybe you can start with you, Tara. Um, what's, uh, what's the, do you do mo modeling? Is there a comparison with other data taken previously? What's the, how the scientific method works for these kind of mysterious signals? Because it's like something you didn't expect to see. So I'm curious to know how you do yeah. it. And it's interesting you mentioned the scientific method because I think this is one of those examples where it's actually really clear that you're, um, you know, going through steps. It's a, it's like doing an experiment. So astronomy, obviously, we don't have laboratories that we're doing the experiment in, but the universe is our laboratory. Um, we're 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 constructing an experiment to try and find something. 
that we hypothesize might be there, but also doing this sort of serendipitous discovery of things that we don't expect. So when we do find something, we go through a series of steps to rule out all the obvious things first. So for example, um, something that changes by a factor of 100 in brightness in just a, in a short time, that means that it can't be due to interstellar scintillation, because if you apply the equations that come from the theoretical models of scintillation, they only allow something to change on, you know, on those timescales of, say, a factor of two. So there's a lot of rigorous maths behind all of that. And, and we sort of take the equations that result at the end of that. And we make a prediction for the direction that we're looking in. And we say, well, it can't be that option. So then we go to the next, you know, most obvious option. And for this, because the object is circularly polarized, we think, aha, it could be a star. We know that flaring stars are often circularly polarized. So what we then did was we go to an archival optical survey. We try to get the deepest one we can find that shows visible light. And we look at the position of our object and see if there are any stars there. Um, there was nothing there. So from that nothing, you can measure what's called a limit. Um, I'm going into a bit of detail because you, you know, you asked about, I guess, yeah. the scientific method. So I'm trying not to use too much technical language, but I'm giving you a bit of technical detail. You measure a limit on what the uh, maximum brightness that that star could be and yet not be detected in the optical image. And that allows you, um, using our theoretical understanding of how stars work, to work out how cool the star must be. And in this case, um, it ruled out almost all types of stars except the coolest stars possible. So then we went to Gemini. We got time on a, on a, on a very powerful optical telescope called Gemini. And we took an observation at that location to try and get a deeper optical image, but still no stars. So then we say it doesn't 100% rule out stars because it is rare in, in science to 100% rule something out, but it's 99% rules out that this could be a star. So then we move on to the next likely option and so on and so on. So we're basically um, going through the, the options that theoretical models and our own observational experience predict. And then we're either using, in astronomy, there's a lot of archival data where they're using data that already exists or we're applying for time on telescopes and getting new data and then using that to rule out those options. As we go through, most of the ones that we're not here talking about today are because they were already identified as something else and ruled out. And what we're talking about today is the really strange things that were left over after we ruled out all of the normal things. Um, so that's how the, the scientific method works in this, in this type of um, sort of exploring the unknown. Natasha, do you want to add something about you on? Yeah, I, I won't go into the details about all the things we ruled out for ours, but I will just comment on the the uh, additional um, crowdsourcing that goes on in astronomy. So, you know, astronomy tends to be a dance between two, maybe three groups, if you include simulation theorists, but uh, between observers who are taking observations and going, look, I found a thing, and theorists who are you know, buried in their minds uh, up to about plasma physics and general relativity and are always thinking, hey, if the universe worked like this, you might see this. And so none of us are the most intelligent, perfect observer and perfect theorist. You know, we tend to specialize a little bit. And so with us, we went through, you know, a lot of different possibilities and brought in, you know, good observational team. But at some point, you just need to write the paper and release it to the community and say, look, we've had a, a couple of good guesses at what this could be, but what do you think? And um, also taking the result to conferences and get, watching other people get excited about it and, you know, throw ideas. Uh, that's a really important thing. You know, the, these are, these are their team discoveries, but they're also like hugely an international team effort to do this sort of interplay between observation and theory to actually understand. So in the couple of weeks that my paper's been out, there've been like three or four different theory papers with ideas that I had not thought of, uh -huh. um, one that I had, but some that I, that I had not thought of before. And uh, it was just, it's really great to see that kind of interest. And I, I think that's how we'll progress. You know, then they'll say, well, if this were the case, you would see this. And so we'll go back and make more observations and find out. Yeah, I like the, the description you give of the scientific method and the way we we do the dis we announce those discoveries. Uh, so where were you when you find out about this signal or you realize that it would be an interesting thing? 
Do you remember the exact moment? Do you I very much do, time? yeah. Um, so at the end of 2020, my student had found this thing and we just knew that it was there in an observation, you know, it showed up as a source that was there one month and gone the next. And that, you know, something that's changing over months is kind of, yeah, maybe there'll be a short paper to write on it. And he went on to move uh, to, to do a PhD with some other folks. So in, in early 2021, I was like, I better look into this source that he found and just see if, you know, it's anything interesting. Like Tara said, I expected to just go through a couple models very quickly and then just go, oh yes, it's a flare star. It's uh, an X-ray binary. But instead, uh, I was looking at the data and, you know, I looked at one observation and then I looked at the next observation and it was gone. And then the next one and it was still not there. So we were all in lockdown in Perth because we were experiencing the pandemic uh, a year late, which is common for things in Perth. Um, and uh, so I was on Slack and I was sort of like, oh, sorry, guys, it looks like maybe it's just a calibration error. You know, maybe uh, it's an airplane, satellite. You know, all the all the, the things you go to when you see something unexpected that's there one second and gone the next. But when it came back, oh my goodness, you know, I, I wrote in the Slack, holy shucks, Batman, it's periodic, because I kept finding it over and over. I could predict when it was going to switch on. And that was just a, such an uncanny feeling. Um, a, a quick thing on this, it's maybe foreshadowing for later, but and when our, we're making these beautiful color images, we have to scan through the different frequencies that we use. So we're just changing those every two minutes. And I've initially, we, our, our source, we found it at 154 megahertz, which is a radio quiet band. So humans are all agree all across the world not to produce radio waves at 154 megahertz because it ruins radio astronomy. So it's one of the quietest bands. So it's very unlikely to be an artificial source. Then I didn't find it and we were didn't find it and we were switching frequencies and when it came back on it was at the same frequency. So what it looked to me like for a moment was a periodic narrow band signal, which, of course, you know if you're all SETI enthusiasts, that is the thing that you're looking for in space yeah. right, you know that is the moment where you think hang on a minute, natural things don't produce narrowband signals. And so, you know, I genuinely had that sort of heart stopping moment. Oh, my life is over. I found a, a 20 minute repeating signal, which is 20 minutes is not a time scale we expect. It's coming in at just one frequency. <gasps> and then I kept looking through the data, you know, don't jump to conclusions, don't get the prime minister on the phone. And I found it at a different frequency. And then another one, and then another one. And there's, if you look at it, it's very, very wide band, very continuous. And so it's probably not a techno signature, um, but it was a, it was a, I, that's why I'm just going to, you know, live on me forever. I'm not going to forget that because what a moment, you know, just uh, trying to do a bit of a astronomy to, to raise the existential dread of being in lockdown. And then you find, you know, possibly the greatest discovery of your career. It's amazing. For like a few seconds, maybe. <laughs> Oh, even Maybe like an hour years. or two before yeah. I got the next set oh, of data. Okay. Oh, wow. <gasps> I would have loved to see you during this hour. <laughs> Just but see. nobody could because we were in lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Tara? Do you remember the, the moment you realized that this signal would be a inter very interesting one? I, I don't think I have anything to add to Natasha's story. Um, that's a great story. But, but no, look, for discoveries like this, like ours, there's not actually a single moment, um, and I hate I hate to say this, but maybe you know sometimes science is a bit less exciting than you think it might be because the very first thing I do if a student you know shows me something like that is says oh have check this check that and so on and so um, it was really just through a slow process of ruling out other options that we eventually thought this is really interesting. So for this particular object, there wasn't like a eureka moment. No, sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Next one, maybe. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to mention to our viewers right now. I think we have more than, yeah, almost 400 people watching us around the world. Uh, we're going to take some questions in a few minutes. So please write them down in the Q&A, not in the chat. And uh, some people can also, we can vote them. So we will ask the question which has the most vote, of course. Um, yeah, so I have some more questions. We're slightly late on our schedule, but I really want to go through this. Um, 
so you mentioned that, uh, Natasha, but Tara, maybe you should start this. Are we certain that those signals are not, or specifically yours, let's talk about you, your discovery, is not a techno signature and why? Yes, I'm, I'm very certain. And um, again, I know that that might be a bit disappointing for people that are hoping for a kind of, um, you know, an alien signal. But uh, there's a few ways that we know that the main one is that uh, we can calculate uh, pretty accurately how much energy you need to produce the signal we see across a very wide bandwidth of frequencies. And we also know the physics that causes emission across a wide bandwidth of frequencies very precisely. So although we are only describing it qualitatively in this talk, we can actually do the maths, so to speak, and, and calculate how much energy you'd need. It's not possible in any way that we know of uh, to generate a broadband signal that bright from near the center of the galaxy in anything other than an astronomical object like a, a star or a pulsar. Um, so firstly, just the amount of power, it's, it's absolutely huge. Secondly, um, the broadband nature of the signal. So um, as Natasha mentioned, uh, most uh, techno signatures, you assume they're going to be narrow band. So all of the uh, objects that we try to keep our telescopes away from, whether they're computers, whether they're mobile phones, um, all of those communication kind of devices, they produce narrow band emission. So if you were in that, um, you know, classic um, uh, uh, contact, you know, movie situation of hearing the emission that has left Earth and has traveled out into space, when you're hearing those radio transmissions, they're narrow band emission. And so if we're assuming that we're trying to detect something like that, um, then these signals are absolutely, you know, nothing like that at all. They're over hundreds and hundreds of megahertz um, as opposed to a sort of narrow band radio transmission. So unfortunately for the people that want it to be something like that, there's absolutely no way um, that, that my object can be anything other than naturally created. Um, okay. I'm a bit disappointed. I thought you would announce something big today, but hey. I know, I know. <laughs> Everyone's disappointed, but it's not aliens this time. <laughs> Hi, Natasha, you already mentioned, maybe you want to add some more about you, um, these comments about... Uh, I entirely echo Tara's comment about the, the wide bandwidth. It's, it just involves, if you do the math and you work out, okay, how much energy do you need to put in? You get out something like a star rotating really quickly, you know, like just enormous amounts of energy that don't make any sense. You know, it if you had civilizations in the galaxy that had access to those kinds of power sources, I don't think the galaxy would look the way that it does. And why would they spend time spreading essentially what looks like static? This is the other thing, no matter how deeply you go into the signal, there's nothing in there other than just sort of the, the kind of hiss, the noise that you expect from natural processes. If you were trying to send a signal, presumably you would do it efficiently and you know, in a narrow band and you'd encode some information. Some people have said to me, well, what if it's aliens just pretending to be a natural looking mm -hmm. object? Well, you can use that argument about anything. Um, my office chair could be an alien pretending to be an office chair. You know, it, if we use aliens as, a, as an explanation for every phenomenon that we don't understand, we're gonna sort of shut down the scientific endeavor pretty quickly. Yeah. I think it's more exciting that these kinds of discoveries show us that we don't really understand the universe yet. And so there's, it's worth continuing to explore. And yeah, if we keep building more and more sensitive radio telescopes, then maybe indeed one day we'll find that signal but this is not it. That's an excellent transition for my questions about the mysteries in the universe. I mean, um, you probably, I would like you to mention a few examples of uh, signals, which was mysterious in the past and end up being uh, explained. And it's more importantly, what, we, what did we learn from that? So maybe you have some example, maybe you can start with you, Tara, if you're ready with one or two examples. Um, sure. So the most obvious one is actually um, the pulsars that we've mentioned uh, many times in this talk, and it ended up uh, winning, the discovery of pulsars ended up winning the Nobel Prize, um, as many people will know. 
Now, the really interesting thing about pulsars is that they were detected multiple times by different people when they were first discovered in the really early eras of radio astronomy. Um, so they were famously discovered um, at Cambridge um, by uh, Jocelyn Bell and her supervisor. Um, but what the scientific community didn't even know at that time is they'd actually been discovered by a radar um, uh, person in the US military who was monitoring for um, in invading aircraft. Uh, so he was his job as a radar operator was to scan the sky uh, looking for um, uh, radar signals. And what he discovered was the first pulsar, but that was all um, actually kept, um, uh, you know, um, I can't remember the word confidential Classified. military you know, information for years until well after the scientific community discovered pulsars, um, and then it only came to light recently. So this was a signal that was extremely uh, periodic. Um, so it, it seemed almost unnatural at first, um, but then uh, what it turned out to be was uh, uh, the emission is coming from um, the uh, axes, the magnetic axes of a neutron star that's rapidly spinning, and we only see the signal when it happens to be pointing to Earth, and the rest of the time we don't see it. And so the periodicity of the signal is because of the rotating neutron star. So pulsars are probably the most famous example in radio astronomy of a really mysterious signal. Um, nobody had any idea what it was at first. It was discovered by scientists, but it was also discovered by um, a military radar operator who also didn't know what it was. Uh, and then as it turns out, um, it became such an important result in astronomy that it, it won that Nobel Prize. And then later, um, won more Nobel Prizes because there's a binary pulsar system that was shown to that demonstrated the existence of gravitational waves. So, you know, that that's probably the biggest uh, discovery I can think of that was a complete mystery signal and turned into a now many decades long area of research in, in that's transformed astronomy. Thank you. What about you, Natasha? I think the, the next kind of closest thing that we've actually almost figured out is fast radio bursts. So um, I actually did a, a summer project, this is all history repeating, in um, pulsar astronomy with a guy called Duncan Lorimer. And uh, we were doing sort of pulsar measurements. That was all very nice. It got me into radio astronomy. Now here I am doing sort of pulsar measurements again. Um, and uh, a couple of years after I left my summer program, he discovered a thing that was for a long time just called the Lorimer signal, which was this very fast, just a few milliseconds, very, very bright um, radio flash. And I mentioned earlier, there's this effect called dispersion where low frequencies arrive a bit slower than the high frequencies, this had an immense amount of dispersion, which implied that it had come from an incredibly far distance, Pro must be outside of our Milky Way. And for about 10 years, people were not really sure whether this was a real thing. They thought, well, maybe they made some mistake. Maybe somebody opened a microwave door and that released a burst of radio, which is what they picked up. And indeed, there is a, you can make a very similar signal by just opening a microwave door at exactly the right time. But uh, eventually, we built very sensitive telescopes like ASCAP and well, there's one in Canada called CHIME, uh, and they started to find more of these fast radio bursts. And now we finally have more fast radio bursts than we have first fast radio burst astronomers. Uh, I think we passed that about a year ago. For a long time, there were far more signals than astro uh, far more astronomers than there were signals work uh, people working on them. Uh, so, so uh, yeah. Anyway, we're now kind of understanding uh, a lot more about these objects. And actually, one of the the, the um, interesting things is we now think that perhaps one of the things that produces fast radio bursts is ultra long period magnetars, and that might be what my source is. So with these powerful telescopes were really like probing all the phenomena and connecting the dots, which is super exciting. Um, so yeah, I, I think we'll make more progress in, in years to come. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have some more questions, but I think we're gonna take 15 minutes to take questions from the, from the audience. Um, so I, I'm gonna try, let's try to have a very short answers. Is that possible? So this is a question oh. from uh, Kushagra for both of you. Uh, these type of works uh, uh, require a lot of patience and determination. 
how do you keep your energy up and what's your mindset during research? <laughs> I agree. Science is exciting, but what leads up to the exciting bits is often very slow. Um, I, I feel like I don't need to keep my you know, energy up and keep patience because I find actually the process really interesting. So I like the problem solving of working with data. Um, and I think as a scientist, you, you kind of have to enjoy it. Uh, but yes, you're right. It's a long, slow process. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, there are good things. I like working with data. There are kind of exhausting things. I'm not still not a big fan of writing endless grant proposals. It would be nice if we had more basic science funding. Um, but whenever I'm a little bit tired and I can't get my mind around a problem, uh, I go for a bike ride and uh, that always helps. So yeah, uh, persistence and cycling. Hi, road bike or mountain bike? Um, more like I've got a Dutch upright. Actually, I've got about 20 bicycles. I go for a tandem if I can. I know Tara's got a tandem <laughs> too. So many cyclists in astronomy. Uh -huh. why. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, question, very technical, but I like this one. So that's why we selected it. So we heard that planets, we know that planets can orbit uh, star, uh, stars, normal star, but also neutron stars, etc. Is it possible that the magnetars that you um, that you observe have planets so uh, as well? And in this case, can this explain the twisted magnetic field that you mentioned, Natasha, as an explanation for you uh, for the signal? Um, it wouldn't be necessary. So I don't think there's any reason that we we couldn't have a planet orbiting this source if if, if it is an ultra long period magnetar. I don't think I'd be able to tell because a neutron star is just so incredibly energetic, a planet isn't going to have very much effect on any of the energetics. Um, if, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be able to tell, and so it wouldn't really explain the magnetic field. It wouldn't really impact it in any way. We do know that, like, normal magnetars, so magnetars which um, spin at sort of one to 12 second periods, they um, basically, we think, they have like a star quake. So they'll be kind of spinning normally and then the crust will get a little bit detached from the core and it'll ripple by just a fraction of a millimeter. But a fraction of a millimeter on a heavy source composed entirely of neutrons is an most incredibly violent outburst. So then they produce X-ray emission for a while and when that switches off, they produce radio emission for a few months, maybe years, and then it stops. So that's very consistent with the properties of the source that we found. The difference is that ours is only spinning once every 20 minutes and people weren't entirely sure whether you'd actually be able to see a source like this. Turns out you can. So a planet doesn't help. Okay. Um, a computer question. We have a lot of people watching us who wants to know how to be involved in radio astronomy now in the future. Some of them even have radio telescope. Uh, one of them asking if he, has, uh, if he used Python code programming do you have libraries to, uh, that you use to generate images? Can you give us some information about that? Tara, you um, want to check this one? Sure, yeah. So we do use um, Python for a lot of our, um, not our back-end processing, but a lot of the analysis that we do as scientists, uh, we use Python. Um, there is a library called AstroPy, which does all of the basic um, things like astronomy coordinate conversions and, and things like that that you can use. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of um, a Python library that we would use for looking at FITS files and so on. But you know what I recommend? If you want to have a look at a lot of the images, then use a tool called Aladdin, um, not a programming tool, uh, but it allows you to look at the images at a position in hundreds of catalogs and um, archival images across all of astronomy. Um, so that's a really great resource that I use as a professional astronomer, but I also recommend um, to anyone who's interested in getting involved. Um, I also, I actually have a MOOC, if you're interested on Coursera called Data Driven Astronomy, and I'm um, sorry, I don't normally like do a plug for something in a talk, but if somebody's actually interested in learning about um, some of you know the techniques we use in the data analysis, they might be interested in, in doing that course, which, which does have Python programming using the astronomy machine, learn pa machine learning packages and so on. All right. So we have the question that I knew we would get. <laughs> so you have discovered mysterious signals in radio. 
there is a mysterious signal in radio that a lot of people have heard about, which is the wow signal. Wow signal, as a way I should say. Um, do you, uh, is that possible the wow signal? Wow signal is in fact a natural signal that you like similar to what you have seen or it's very different. Can you tell us a bit about this? Natasha, you want to start with that or? Yeah, so, so the wow signal is interesting. It is extremely bright. Uh, it, it's, uh, I think, sort of 10, 15, 20 seconds long, which is quite, quite persistent. Um, and of course, the fascinating thing is that it's narrow band. And that is, you know, very, very exciting compared to all the other radio astronomy signals. Um, the thing is that there are, when I say, oh, the wide band implies it's not aliens, that doesn't mean that a narrow band is aliens, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there can be a group of narrow band signals that you can get. So. Um, the fast radio bursts that I was talking about earlier, a lot of them have uh, fairly wide bandwidths, um, maybe a few hundred megahertz, but often you'll look with other telescopes at the same time, at, at a different frequency, you won't see them. Or even with a, the same telescope with quite a wide band, you'll only see the signal confined to a small part of the band. And yet we're not going around saying, oh, yeah, fast radio bursts, it has to be aliens because some of them look quite narrow band. What we think is that there is um, basically some stuff between us and where the emission is generated that could be scattering, confining, um, changing the way the signal propagates in space and basically reduces that bandwidth. Or there's an emission mechanism, which is when it's generating the radio. Um, not all emission mechanisms are sort of infinitely wideband. There's some like electron cyclotron masers which are relatively narrow band. At the time that wow signal was taken, I don't think that they had the frequency resolution to really um, probe all of the details that would unveil the emission processes. Uh, and I think it's probably just a matter of time before we find another signal like that. Hopefully with new instrumentation, we'll be able to actually understand what generated it. And hey, maybe it was you know, aliens, that would be great. But I'm just saying there are quite a lot of natural processes that could generate such a signal. So yeah, let's just look out for another one. Okay. Tara, you want to add something on this the wow signal? Um, I would just add that it's an it's a perfect example of how because it was only observed once, um, you know, whether the thing we're observing is a techno signature or whether it's a natural phenomenon, if you just see it once for a short time, and that's the only data you have, it's extremely difficult to to work out what it is or to do a lot of science with it. And and that's why in astronomy, uh, when we do see one of these rare objects once, we aim to observe multiple times or see more of them so that we can, you know, help solve the mystery. It's, it's very hard with one observation. So I think with the wow signal, there's really nothing more that can be done given the data, you know, the limitations of the data of the time. Yeah, I'm sorry to insist on that, but I, I, have, I have a question from John Lee here. It's very specific. At which point... At will you say that the phenomena that you observe may be a techno signatures? Um, yeah, personally okay. for me, it would need to encode some information. I think that's the overwhelming thing. I mean, the energetics are quite uh, important. It would, it would be very sort of strange and pointless to go around pretending to be a magnetar or a, a, a flare star. Why would you do that? It'd be very inefficient for communication because your communications would constantly be mistaken for other natural objects. It's very strange. But if there were uh, some kind of information encoded in the signal, I think that would um, make it a bit more uh, compelling. And uh, certainly, at least from our point of view, when we've tried to produce signals that other civilizations could pick up, we've tried to keep it very simple digits of pi, you know, uh, adding simple sequences together, Fibonacci sequence, you know, keep things basic, keep things rooted in pure mathematics. Um, and hopefully that would be interpretable to uh, other minds. So that for me, it would be information. Um, I think this is actually a good point to explain how the, the um, SETI searches and the other uh, the astronomy we do fit together on radio telescopes, because I know I feel like I keep giving you really, you know, disappointing answers, but 
I couldn't actually find a techno signature with my science because we, we actually exclude all of the data that would appear of that form. We take it out before I process the rest. So um, I mentioned radio frequency interference uh, before from mobile phones and TVs and airplanes. Most of that, that's all narrow band. And so when you look at my data um, and you see those lines of RFI in it, we use algorithms to remove them all before I do science. Now, some of the same telescopes that, that I use, for example, the, the Parkes telescope, are also used as part of, you know, through the breakthrough listen and so on, um, to look for techno signatures. Mm -hmm. um, and they do the opposite. They want the, the, the type of data that I actually remove. So um, these uh, searches operate in, in what we call like a piggybacking way, where we can do science with the data and people can also search a different aspect of the data for techno signatures. So for me personally, none of my signals are ever going to be techno signatures because I've already removed them. Um, but other people may be able to look in my data and find them. Okay. A uh, question a bit more light. <laughs> Why <laughs> those arrays are in Australia? Uh, you mentioned the quiet zone, etc. but there is more than this, right? Kangaroos, snakes. Uh, yeah. What is it? <laughs> so, you know, um, those telescopes, that, the two telescopes we're talking about today, ASCAP and the MWA, they are both telescopes that were built um, as SKA sort of precursors and pathfinders. So trying out the technology for the square kilometre array. People might have heard about this. It's a, it's a billion dollar multinational project um, that is going to build the biggest radio telescope that has ever existed. And it's being built half in Australia and half in South Africa. And so the two telescopes we were discussing, they were built on that site because that's also the site of the um, square kilometer array in Australia. So we were testing out not just the technology, but also the radio quietness of that site as a suitable place to build the SKA. Now, more generally, why are those telescopes there? That gets back to what I said in my talk. They've been put in places around the world that in general are as radio quiet as possible. And in fact, the uh, population density in that region of Australia is about two or three people per square kilometre. So, um, you know, the less people, the less devices, the less radio interference. So that's the that's the short answer. Okay, Natasha, are you, uh, you okay with that? It's not the spider? Oh, yeah, yeah. No. I don't have anything okay. about that. <laughs> All right, maybe you should, um, I have two more questions. And one is about the SKA, you mentioned it. So let's talk about the SKA. What's your involvement in this project? Uh, Natasha, you want to start maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, so the SK Observatory is like a international uh, organization and um, they're a group of people mo mostly headquartered in the UK. Uh, I've visited a couple of times as like a, you know, visiting academic uh, as a fellow I give talks, you know, uh, give feedback about um, the kinds of calibration that they're planning to do, that sort of thing. Um, but I'm also the co-chair of a science working group. So across the world, um, pretty much any uh, professional astronomer can join one of these SK science working groups. Mine is focused on extragalactic continuum, which basically means everything behind me that isn't in the Milky Way. Um, and so people looking at clusters of galaxies smashing into each other and distant supermassive black holes. Scientists from all around the world will have, we have, meet, we'll have a meeting, we'll talk about our recent results, and we'll think, how does this feed into the SKA? So that's all sort of volunteer. We just do that on our spare time because we want the instrument to really serve the needs of the community. Mm -hmm. And there are science working groups for transient, for search for extraterrestrial life, for understanding our galaxy, our nearby galaxies, all sorts of different kinds of groups. Uh, and we're constantly feeding back to the observatory. Okay, this is the state of the field. This is what we'd like to see. Um, the SK is now kind of in a state where they're procuring contracts and starting construction. So there's a little bit of a lull now while we kind of wait for things to get built. We've already given our input. Now we need to see what happens. Uh, but we're all going to be ready to use it, I think, when uh, the first data starts rolling out. And you, Tara, you also involved in the SKA? Yes, I, I'm involved in the um, Transients Working Group. And yeah, I think Natasha's covered that really well, that, that question. So what's the, uh, what's the when will be the first light of this instrument? 
That is a good question. I don't have the up-to-date timeline. Go to the oh, yeah. SKA website. Uh, it will be within it will be within a few years that we have the first um, uh, phase. You know, they're constructing the first phase now. Okay. So. Well, that's lead, lead me to my last question, in fact. So what kind of major discoveries do you expect in your field in radio astronomy in general? If you could guess the future, what do you think will be the major discovery in the next 10, 15 years? Um, I, could, I could say Go something ahead. as a start, um, but it's not to do with radio transients. Um, I think it could be the epoch of reionization. So uh, there's a lot of teams at the moment around the world in radio astronomy trying to detect the period uh, where the universe reionized and look at the first, you know, time that um, stars and galaxies formed. So right back in the very distant history of the universe. And I think that's uh, at the moment, uh, there are many telescopes, including the MWA uh, uh, that are being used to work on that, have not made a detection uh, yet, but I think it's likely in the next 10 years. The first slide of the radio signal of the reionization of the of the universe, basically. Yeah. Wow. All right. Good. I learned something today. What about you, Natasha? Um, I, I do agree with Tara. I think that's probably the biggest impact, um, most exciting, and you know, uh, just huge. It's, it's in a way, it's why all these telescopes were built at low frequencies because we expect to see that signal at around 150 megahertz. Um, but when you look at what uh, observatories and telescopes are built to do, um, they have these sort of key science priorities and you, you know, you put Hubble up and you expect to do, you know, certain, do certain measurements. And then you end up discovering all sorts of unexpected things which end up being far more important than uh, the reason you built the observatory in the first place. Uh, and that Murchison Widefield Array is, is exactly case in point with this new radio transient um, we built the telescope to do epoch of reionization studies, and yet the very uh, highest profile paper that has gone in the most prestigious journal is this uh, uh, radio transient, which has kind of upended uh, what we expect from periodic transients um, in, in radio astronomy. So uh, I think we'll find something completely unexpected, and that's going to be wonderful. And maybe an extraterrestrial signal. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. But I do like this as a, as a conclusion. It's true that astronomers, we always design instruments to answer to a very important question. That's why we build JWST, the extremely large telescope, the SK, et cetera. And at the end, major discovery has made thanks to those facilities because we see the unexpected. And that's the main point of being a scientist is to be always open-minded to be because if we are not open-minded, we will miss those mysterious signals. And I'm very glad I invited you to, to talk about those two uh, mysterious signals in radio astronomy and how they could be, how they have been discovered and how they could be useful in the future for all of us. So thank you very much to both of you. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Natasha. Really appreciate uh, talking to you tonight. And Simon's gonna give the final words. Yes, no, thank you. I think that you know, the one guarantee is that just as you begin to understand every single single signal that you get, that will be the time that something blasts down and, and you start all over again with some great new mystery. And that, that's what makes it so exciting because you never quite know when that's going to happen. Um, thank you very much, Tara. Thank you so much, Natasha. Uh, thank you, Frank. Um, I thank uh, Rebecca, Lee, and Jasmine behind the scenes for this talk. Um, you will not be receiving a fat paycheck for this presentation, but you will be receiving a very, very special SETI Talks mug that will be winging its way, um, I don't know, by packet steamer, probably down to, yeah. to Australia, so um, in another few years. Uh, we had people listening from all over the world, uh, India, Australia, of course, um, LA, Toronto, Knoxville, Tennessee, Denver, Brazil, Mexico City, Tokyo, Lima, uh, Athens, that's Athens, Greece, um, Florida, the UK, Guatemala, we had somebody from the Phoenix Astronomical Society, and we had somebody signing in from the Andromeda Galaxy, and so they will be enjoying this presentation <laughs> in two million years time. Um, if you are interested in the work of the SETI Institute and our 
telescope array, the Allen telescope array, please do um, go onto our website, uh, SETI.org, to hear more about the, the investigations that the SETI Institute is doing. Um, if you enjoyed this talk and want to watch it again or want to watch any of the other previous uh, SETI talks, they are on our YouTube channel. And as I did mention at the very beginning, we are a nonprofit organization. Um, so any, any donations really help us uh, to keep going, keep presenting these, these free and exciting science talks. And if you are interested in, in sponsoring a future SETI talks, please do uh, drop us an email, uh, development at SETI. Dot org. And on that, I will say good night to everyone and thank you again uh, to our speakers. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Us. Cheers. Bye bye.